have for questions. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Is this on? Okay, great. Um, it is so fun to be back here. It's just great. And I really, um, I feel like I really pulled a fast one on you because I'm an observer. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I snuck into the ITC somehow delightfully, and now I'm here. Um, so uh, today I want to talk to you about um, very distant galaxies, some of the first galaxies in the universe. If time permits, some of the first supermassive black holes. Time's probably not going to permit if we're being real here. So, but no one likes black holes anyway. Um, so the uh, <laughs> kidding. Um, but before I do that, I want to briefly mention a topic that is near and dear to my heart, um, which is this. And this is not just because I'm from Minnesota, um, though that probably has something to do with it. Um, this is actually a book that's written by um, Robert Sutton is, uh, is a professor at Stanford in uh, business management um, and management science. I didn't know that was a thing, but it is. Um, and this, uh, he's dedicated a significant portion of his career to uh, describing empirically why having people at your institution who are mean or denigrating to others is not actually a good decision for the productivity of your institution. So um, I would recommend this read when you're thinking about making hiring choices. Um, and uh, it's it really, I think, is also just as a general thing, like makes the community better if we're all kind and generous to one another. That being said, I'm gonna say some really controversial stuff today, so feel free to just have at me. Like, this does not apply to me. You can just let me have it, so that's totally fine. Um, okay, so before we talk about uh, these galaxies at the edge of the observable universe, um, we're gonna start a little closer to home, to my home, Boulder, Colorado. Um, this is actually where the uh, mirrors for the James Webb Space Telescope, which I'll be talking about today, um, were, were constructed. Um, so we have these um, 18 gold-plated beryllium hexagons. You know, we're all familiar with these iconic mirrors. Um, each of these are four feet across. They were built um, a long time ago and then shipped across the country where they're assembled into our fabulous James Webb Space Telescope. Um, this is, work on this thing began in 1996. So it has been really eating up a lot of resources for a long time. I'm going to try to argue to you that this was worth it. You can make your own decision on that. Um, and so we, we built this thing. We, uh, it was $10 billion. It took decades. Uh, it's, Things were constructed all over the globe, so it's really a testament to international collaboration. It really, um, parts of this were built all over the U.S., all over um, the Europe, Canada. It, it was really a, a, an effort of a lot, a lot of people. Um, so we shipped this thing through the Panama Canal, and then on uh, December 25th, 2021, we launched this bad boy into space, and I'm not going to lie, I cried. When it didn't explode. This. Now, okay, we're gonna, that's anticlimactic. Okay, uh, we're gonna go without sound on that. <laughs> We're not going for the remix here, guys. Yeah, so the uh, uh, so we, this thing launched. Um, notably, it did not explode on launch. <laughs> In which case, I would not be here today if it had, because uh, I wouldn't have a job. Um, but it it launched actually even better than we expected. And so um, instead of just getting the nominal five years out of this thing, we're getting, uh, we're, we think we'll get at least 20. Um, so this, uh, everyone was very happy. We all celebrated. Uh, we spent the next month being very concerned um, as it took uh, 30 days to go a million miles out to L2, which um, in case uh, orders of magnitude are unfamiliar, that's, that's far away. Um, so we can't, we can't fix it if something is wrong with it. Um, and there's a lot of things that could have gone wrong. There is 
a ton of single point failures on this because you have to fold out this sun shield. You guys are all familiar with this. I'm just emphasizing the point here. These things are about the thickness of tinfoil. Um, tinfoil is really easy to rip if you've ever wrapped a sandwich. Um, and so and everything had to go perfectly. And then we had to align this mirror, um, which is not always flawless, as I'll discuss later, um, to within one thousandth the width of a human hair, right? All while this thing is hurtling through space and we can't fix it. We can't do like we did with Hubble and go put some glasses on it. Um, so this thing, it's fragile. It's really far away. It is $10 billion. So the question is, why did we do this? Right? Why did we invest this much money, this much time to sending this incredibly fragile instrument incredibly far away? Um, and my argument to you is that it's actually your fault. So um, the reason I say that is because um, I think, you know, this is one of uh, several hot takes that will happen during this talk, but um, I think in since the, you know, the launch of Hubble, Observations have actually kind of started to lag behind theory. There's been so much um, advancement, especially in um, what I'm familiar with, which is uh, extragalactic astrophysics by a lot of the people in this room that have really allowed us to make these model universes that really resemble the true universe. Um, and we needed to actually push the boundaries of what we were able to observe in order to actually be able to test these models. So, um, so $10 billion, that's your fault. Just, you know, sit with that. Um, and, uh, it, but it's really allowing us to push far beyond what we even thought was possible. We're seeing um, galaxies form much earlier than we thought. We're seeing the formation of the first supermassive black holes. It's an incredibly exciting time. And this is possible because, of course, um, we are able to look to higher redshifts because we're seeing in the infrared. And that is all made possible because of all of these incredibly challenging technical features of this telescope, the sun shield, the micro shutter array, the 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 mirror, all of these things were huge technological advancements that have allowed us to push back um, the cosmic horizons, as we're discussing in this conference. So um, we, you know, we wanted to do this both to um, find places where we could prove the theorists wrong, and also um, so that you know we could understand our cosmic origin story. Right? We can. The one of the key reasons that we launched this telescope is so that we could understand the formation of the first galaxies and supermassive black holes. Ideally, the first stars, though. You know, we'll see how that goes. Um, the and. The galaxies are really kind of the, you know, the fundamental gravitational building block of our universe. They, you know, it's where all the stars, black holes, everything is. So we want to understand the formation of the first of these. Um, and we need to do this in the infrared because, of course, you know, we're looking out to really high redshifts, really early cosmic times. Um, so we could do this previously. Um, so this, uh, does anyone know what this is? Probably not. You're theorists. The galaxy. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> um, it's a couple galaxies. Um, you will shortly recognize this. Um, so this is the SMACS, um, SMACS galaxy cluster field, and that was um, the previous best infrared image of it, um, which was in Spitzer. Um, so as you can see, there is, uh, it's, there's a significant improvement with JWST, um, both in the depth, all of those little um, red dots are... Um, distant, for the most part, are distant galaxies, and they're just popping out of the noise in this previous Spitzer image. Um, and we can also actually resolve them. We can see what these objects actually look like, which gives us key physical insights into how they form. Um, so we're really, this is a really significant improvement over what we previously had. Um, when uh, Biden released um, the images, um, it was like, you know, I guess maybe Biden is hipper than I think he is, but he really was on trend with this. And, you know, they delayed the thing like 20 years. He delayed it an extra two hours. Um, so we all, you know, sat around uh, drinking champagne, waiting, waiting, waiting for this thing to happen. But when we did, the data was spectacular. It was better than anyone was anticipating. Um, so the first thing that I noticed um, was this puppy. Um, so what you can see is there is this 
big fat red object. Um, and like, you know, being in the mood I was in at the time, we decided to call them UFOs. Um, that's, that's where we were. Um, cause for ultra red flattened objects. Um, and so there, we saw all of these, um, these objects that were big, bright red and completely invisible with Hubble. And the thing that was most surprising about these objects um, is actually what they looked like, which is what James Webb allowed us to actually determine for the first time. We've long known that there are objects which are incredibly dusty, incredibly old, incredibly red, but we were not able, um, and we could detect them with Spitzer, but we had no idea what they looked like. And so we were expecting to see these like compact, um, red, massive objects, right? Because if you want something to be highly dust obscured, you really need a high dust column density towards the thing. And so you expect them to be very compact. And so when we see these big extended objects, it was really surprising. So one of the things that was surprising is that they have, um, we expected them to be very centrally concentrated. Um, instead, they were not. They're very, they're, they're disc-like. Um, and they're, they're basically exponential. This is um, work by my graduate student, Justice. Um, and they, you know, so we, we expected these centrally concentrated objects. As observers, we measure this with the Sersic index, you know, which you could argue there's better things. But um, so this was really surprising. They're these very disky objects that we think should be compact and spheroidal. Um, and they're, you know, we expected them to be spheroids ellipticals, something, you know, we did not expect. And what we saw instead is that they are these big, disky objects. Um, so these things are really odd. They challenge our ideas of how um, massive, dusty objects form in the early universe. These are, you know, these are some of the most extreme objects. We kind of expect them to form in these big mergers where you have a ton of dust, a ton of gas, very concentrated objects um, that are luminous in the submillimeter in the infrared. And it turns out we see a bunch of disks. So it's a very odd thing. We still don't totally understand what's going on here, which is where you come in when we can't explain things. Um, so when we were selecting these objects, um, one of them was different. So we, you know, we do a color selection, blah, 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 all the observer stuff. Um, so the, one of these things was different and it was, it was this buddy. Um, so this doesn't look like much. It looks like a little red dot, which is basically what most things in the early universe look like, which is really too bad for press releases. I have to say, you know, ideally you want something that's a nice picture, but if you're pushing the limits of the telescope, you're just going to get ugly stuff. That's just what it is. Um, so this one was different. Um, and uh, so, you know, we, we, of course, the first thing we do is try to infer the actual um, stellar um, properties of these objects. So we try to fit the redshift. We try to fit the stellar mass. These are imperfect um, fit, fitting mechanisms we have here. Um, but uh, my uh, friend and collaborator, Rachel Bazanson and I were trying to fit this thing. Um, and we found that it had a super high mass at a super high redshift. Um, and it was really surprising that, and so, you know, I sent a Slack message to my group that was like, everyone who has time, please help. This thing needs to go into nature tomorrow. Um, and the reason, um, so, you know, discovering this thing was definitely like the highlight of my scientific career. And, you know, it's sure, like, it's massive high redshift, who cares? So the, why is this actually, why is this actually relevant? Why do we care? So um, the reason that we care, um, and this is obviously one of the many reasons why having theoretical predictions in advance of this telescope um, being launched was incredibly important um, is because like, and this is, I recognize a blindingly obvious thing to say, but uh, small things form first, uh, then gradually bigger and bigger things form. So if you're seeing really big things at really early cosmic times, that is not really what we had predicted. And of course, you can make quantitative predictions for these things, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but we, you know, we're really not expecting to see, when we look at the very early universe, we're expecting to see low mass young objects. We're not expecting to see mature, massive galaxies, which is what we're seeing. Um, 
So we, um, so we sent this, uh, the, these, this, these SEDs to our colleague, um, Eva Labe, who was in Europe at the time, so he could do stuff during the day. He found another five of them. Um, and so we had this sample of surprisingly massive galaxies at really early cosmic times. Uh, so based on the, uh, the best fits to these objects, um, there, you know, the, you know, this is like very deep in observer land, but the the shapes of their spectral energy distributions were fundamentally different than the objects we were able to select with Hubble, right? Because we're actually able to select at redder wavelengths. Um, and so they're just much, much, much redder than the previous um, high early objects in the un early universe we were able to see. Um, so they have these qualitatively different SED shapes based on the best fit. <laughs> Fits um, modeling gives them, you know, redshift seven to nine, and stellar masses in general of greater than ten to the ten solar masses. Um, so before this, um, no candidate galaxy with a mass of greater than uh, ten to the ten point five had been found before redshift seven, and none with um, a mass of greater than. 10 to the 10 had been found before redshift eight. So these are really, really extreme objects according to our um, previous understanding of what the universe was like at these epochs. So these are the previous, um, the um, cumulative uh, stellar mass densities based on um, Hubble and uh, Spitzer. And these objects lay, lie way up here. So really, um, if, if they pan out, which we'll get to that, um, the, you know, the implied stellar mass density is much higher than we had expected previously. And that stellar mass density may be in massive objects instead of low mass objects, which is, you know, just goes, flies in the face of what we think um, the, you know, the basic, our basic counting statistics of galaxies uh, appear to be. Um, so uh, there was a theory paper that was put out shortly after after ours by Mike Boylan Colchin, um, which basically made um, uh, predictions for, you know, you can use of course, cosmological models to make predictions in a very simple way, um, just painting galaxies onto dark matter halos um, for how many um, for you know how many objects of a given mass you would expect. And so this is just purely based on dark matter and then you know the baryon fraction. Um, and so you make predictions for what where you think these objects should lie, um, and the you know you end up um, with the fiducial stellar mass estimates, which um, spoiler alert will come down. Down. Um, the you know you need these very high efficiencies um, in principle of converting um, of converting baryons into stars, which star formation, as we will hear, I think probably later from Blakesley, is a very inefficient process. Um, we really do not expect these very high baryon conversion efficiencies, and you know we're no longer you know above this black line of what's feasible in a Lambda CDM cosmology, as everyone expected. Um, but it, we do still see quite high baryon conversion efficiencies. Um, so this, um, we got some fun press on this, which was exciting. Um, the uh, I got to make my TV debut, which was neat. Um, that was terrifying. Um, terrifying. Um, but of course we need spectroscopy because, um, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, you know, a number of papers came out after this saying in effect, you're a bunch of morons. Um, and so, you know, fair, fair. Um, you know, everyone makes mistakes, but, um, so the, uh, in particular, the concern was you're looking at objects in the very early universe right? These things likely formed all of their stars very recently because the universe isn't very old. Ta-da! Um, so you, and what you expect of things that have formed very recently um, is that they have really whopping emission lines, like very, very bright emission lines. Um, and emission lines so bright that they completely dominate the, the, um, the photometry that we have, right? All we had at this juncture was Images. We didn't have spectra, um, and so you know you can interpret that light as coming from the continuum of stars, or these really of like an older stellar population, or these really whopping emission lines from very young stellar populations. And so the obvious criticism here is that 
Um, these are not actually older stellar populations. You're interpreting this light as continuum when in fact it's just emission lines. And these are really, really young, really low mass objects actually, you morons. Um, so uh, that, um, so we needed to get spectra. So we got them um, kind of, uh, the reason I say kind of is because um, there was a mirror tilt event during my observations. So the data quality is really bad, um, unfortunately. So we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to retake, unfortunately, until next year. Um, we were able to salvage some things, though. Um, and the key point here being, um, and I'm sorry, this is ugly. This is not yet published. Working on it. Um, but my undergrads nearly killed me, so uh, that is why this is not submitted yet. Um, so the uh, so the the main point here is that these are not emission line dominated. The main criticism of this work was that these things would be emission line dominated, and they are not. They have emission lines. We confirm the redshifts. Um, the redshifts are slightly lower than anticipated based on the photometry, um, but these things are not emission line dominated. They have continuum. They have, and in some cases. Um, like, uh, like in the one, um, in, uh, on, oh man, that one, um, this is, um, as well as a couple other ones that, um, were just published this week, um, by, um, my colleague, uh, Bing Ji Wang. Um, some of these actually have Balmer breaks at a redshift of seven to eight. Those are the highest Balmer breaks that have ever been detected. Um, and what that means is there is actually evidence for some mature stellar populations at these very early cosmic times. The masses are still very uncertain, um, but we do see uh, we do see some evidence that the there is these actually massive stellar populations. So we have these spectroscopic confirmations. Actually, the first spectroscopic confirmation, not of this sample, but of massive galaxies at early cosmic times uh, was by uh, Meng Wan, my colleague, um, uh, who spectroscopically um, confirms some of these incredibly massive galaxies um, using the Fresco survey. Um, and these are at slightly lower redshift, but they're much, much more massive. Um, so this, this kind of picture that we're seeing potentially, um, these objects grow way earlier than we thought um, is kind of is consistent with some of the other um, early observations we have from James Webb, namely um, that we see these um, these objects that uh, we you know there was a ton and you know just like ours there will be changes in the picture here but there was a ton of uh, really luminous really high redshift galaxies that were um, allegedly detected you know uh, in the early in the early JWST data um, that imply uh, much a much higher uh, number density of really luminous galaxies than we had thought possible. These all this all suggests that we need to start the process of galaxy formation earlier than we think potentially. Um, most of these still need to be um, spectroscopically confirmed. Um, the the Jade Survey, which um, Daniel is. Um, significantly in charge of has done a lot of this spectroscopic confirmation, which has been great, as have a number of other teams. Um, and so we're, but we're still, these are, this is a work in progress because of how time is allocated on James Webb um, to actually spectroscopically confirm some of these objects. And some of them so far have held, some have fallen. Um, the other thing that is consistent with potentially things happening earlier than we thought, um, my, um, my, undergraduate student, Abby, um, who's going to be starting grad school next fall, um, looked at uh, some of the earliest quench galaxies in the, um, in again, the TNG uh, simulation that a lot of the people in this room, Annalisa, Lars, Volker, all um, worked a lot on to create shy. Um, and the, and one of the things that we're seeing is that we are actually seeing evidence for, um, for quenched objects earlier in the real universe potentially than in um, than in our simulations. Um, so maybe there is other quenching physics. You guys can have at me for this. That's fine. Um, so the, uh, but we, we think that maybe things are actually starting to quench at earlier cosmic times as well. Um, one of the big mysteries here, um, which I'm just going to leave you hanging on because we're short on time, um, is that, so we see these, you know, everything in the early universe looks like a little red dot, which is neat. Um, 
Some of us think they're really massive galaxies. Some of us think that they're actually baby quasars, um, but they're everywhere. There's a ton of them, and we're still working on the interpretation. Um, so one of the possibilities, one of the ways to, we can bring down these stellar masses that are in tension with our models is if instead um, some of that light is contributed by an accreting supermassive black hole. So that is another possibility that we're still um, looking into. Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that, but so, you know the evidence is really mixed on this. Um, you, you know, Some of the observational evidence that is, in general, key signatures of AGN um, could also be uh, due to uh, really compact stellar mass. So, um, so to summarize, um, we um, galaxies we think um, based on our um, uh, based on some of our observations with JWST, um, they're older, they're more massive, they are chunkier. It's not chunkier um, than expected. Um, maybe did galaxy formation um, begin happening earlier than we had anticipated, or did it happen faster or more efficiently? We don't know. Um, the you know, which forms first, the first galaxies, the, the first supermassive black holes? We don't know. Um, do we have any idea what's going on? Probably not. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Erica, for a wonderful talk. And of course, there are many theories in the audience They might explain it. Uh, the <laughs> obvious question was, you didn't mention why it's not lensing. Uh, it's Magnification uh, bias. You, you don't think there is any lensing here? No, okay. but. <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe. Because at high redshifts, it could be quite uh, high optical depth for lensing. But uh, yeah, I, I I think based on um, I think based on the clustering, it's unlikely. Okay. But well, there should be a foreground lens yeah. if that's the yeah. case. Yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah. Fair point. Fair point. Thank you. Questions? Please go ahead, Smada. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Um, I want to ask about the thing that you didn't have enough time to talk about. How massive do you need to have the black hole in order to explain it? And then do you, in, do you introduce then another problem or is it a real explanation? Right, if it's too massive, it's a problem, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So the you know the black hole the the black hole masses vary a lot. Um, we just like with the estimates for the stellar mass, they're based on a lot of assumptions, um, which may or may not be correct. Um, they're in general the the black hole masses that are implied are quite low actually. So they're they're not really if anything they help kind of um, because you know and some of them have very high black hole masses. You know there's been a huge range of um, black black hole masses found. In one of the objects, um, it was actually like the lowest mass black hole above a redshift five that's ever been detected. It's like 10 to the five or something. So it's a quite low mass black hole um, that can, you know, produce that much luminosity. But um, the, you know, one of the, one of the ways, key ways we, we think we know if something is a black hole is if it has these really broad, broad emission lines, right? Um, which is, you know, reminiscent of a broadline region, but um, that, you know, if you have a super compact object, you can also get broad lines from, um, from just the normal orbits of, of stars and gas. So, um, so I think the evidence is pretty mixed and it's, you can really get a huge, a huge range of stellar masses based on how much you infer, um, how much of that continuum you think is from the supermassive black hole. Yeah. There is actually a paper a few days ago on the archive, theoretical, suggesting that obscured uh, quasars make up this population. But um, because people are talking about over massive black holes now, so even more than we expected from the M sigma relations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're not yeah. detecting X rays though. So, mm -hmm. any other comments or questions? Please, can you speak loud? So, uh, I can sure. um, so yeah. in the naive uh, simulator like me, when you see a Barma break, what does that, when does that imply that the stellar population you have was forming? And uh, would you expect populations of stars forming at very high redshift to have the same like time to form a Barma break as a stellar break? Short answer, yes. Long answer, MJ. Mm. <laughs> you wanna, you're the expert. <laughs> 
Uh, you need, you need like, you know, at least like a hundred to more hundreds of millions of years. Yeah. Well, we have to move on and we are all rooting for your future discoveries. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> um, and we will balance the picture of observational puzzles with theoretical explanations.